Hello, I'm Carlos Hoyos. I'm, I'm the module coordinator for year four, and I'm here to talk to you about mental state examination. Um, as you know, this is the uh, third video on the series of four videos to introduce psychiatry. Um, so mental state examination, uh, that's the examination of somebody's state of mind. Um, so we talked before in the introductory video about somebody presenting with a certain behavior, emotions and thoughts and how we infer that there is a mind producing those behaviors. Um, and uh, that is because behavior, emotions and thoughts are functions uh, of a mind. Yes, so uh, the mental state examination uh, uh, goes systematically looking at each function that the mind performs very much in the same way as a physical examination goes through the systems in the body. Yes. Um, so when we examine and present a mental state examination, we go systematically through all the functions of the mind. Yes. And behavior, emotions and thought are three of the functions of the mind, uh, we normally split behavior into more um, uh, headings. So we often talk about appearance as a function of behavior and an indication of a state of mind, how somebody looks. Uh, also language, how somebody speaks, that also tells us about the state of their mind and it, it is essentially a behavior. We also add other psychological functions. So, for instance, instead of emotions, we look at, we call it mood, and that encompasses a wide rate or range of emotions. We also examine how well they are perceiving the world. You know, so, do they have a normal perception of the world? Uh, and also, whether they're able to understand things, cognition, you know, whether they are orientated in time or their memory is working, all those other functions. And lastly, the idea of insight, which is um, whether they're aware, whether there's any difficulties for, with themselves. The mind has many, many other functions, but these are the functions that traditionally we examine when we conduct a mental state examination. And those act very much like the shelves in a fridge, as I was telling you in, when, in the video on history taking. Uh, we organize the information about somebody's mind around those headings, and we are expected to put certain things in certain shelves, always in the same place. So when we communicate, we are uh, able to transfer information efficiently and quickly. So when we come up across a patient, we um, uh, are going to look at those things. So the doctor um, uh, meets with the patient and has to conduct a mental state examination. Mental state examination consists of, uh, if you want, three uh, phases. So first of all, uh, the doctor needs to elicit um, uh, enough information as to be able to infer whether the mind is able to perform those functions. And, and the doctor does that by observing, by listening and by interacting. Yes. Once uh, those, func those um, symptoms are elicited, uh, the doctor needs to find a way of naming those. Uh, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, but it is a big part of the mental state to know which words to use to describe which uh, mental experiences. And then you need to be able to present those succinctly. And that's what is uh, normally referred to as a mental state examination. Yes. So I've told you we need to elicit a name and present. I'm going to focus on the first two, how you go about eliciting and naming uh, um, uh, what you find in the different shelves of the mind. Uh, of the different functions of the mind. But before I go on there, I need to uh, explain a couple of words. Uh, so th the, the key word is the idea of a phenomenon or the plural phenomena. So a phenomenon is anything that is or can be experienced or felt. Uh, that's a very wide word. And let me uh, uh, explain to you roughly how it works. A phenomenon is something that every, you experience. It doesn't have to be something in the mind. So, for, for instance, um, a phenomenon is the, that we experience is that when we drop things, uh, they fall to the floor. 
consciousness. So uh, we could uh, describe that phenomenon uh, and say, when I drop, uh, when I let go of something, it falls to the ground. Yes. And then we could qualify it and say it falls quite fast um, and it always falls at the same speed. In fact, you know, I can give you a mathematical equation of how fast things fall, fall to the floor. So I'm describing what the phenomena I'm seeing. But I could also name that phenomena with specific jargon. So, for instance, in physics, that's called gravity. Yes. And then I could infer the cause for it if I know ab about kind of the deformation of space time continuum through mass. Uh, but let's not work about cause. The same thing applies to psychological phenomena. We can describe it, we can qualify it, or we can use jargon to explain it. And we can make a causal attribution as to what is uh, producing it. The jargon used to uh, name specific psychological phenomena is called psychopathology. Yes? So this is a very, very big field of psychology, which is the ability to name things specifically. So, for instance, a medical phenomena is that some people get yellow skin. Yes. Uh, so we could say the patient presents with yellow skin. Yes. And we could say uh, qualified. So yellow skin all over, including the inside of the eyes. Yes. Or we could say that's icterisia. Yes. Because we are doctors and we know the jargon. In psychology, the jargon is called psychopathology. And today is going to be a lot about psychopathology. No, let's not uh, lose track of causes. Causes are pathology. So Pathology causes psychopathology, uh, but the mental state is not about making a diagnosis, it's about describing the symptoms that eventually will lead to a diagnosis. So in psychiatry, this works something like this. So a patient presents and says, I can hear aliens talking to me inside my head. Yes, And we could describe this and say the patient experienced the voice of an alien and then qualified and said this is paranoid because it's, it's, uh, um, it's uh, related to himself. Uh, so we're qualifying a phenomena we're describing. Or we could use the proper psychopathological language, which is the patient is experiencing second person auditory uh, pseudo hallucinations. And of course, that might have to do with schizophrenia. The importance of a mental state is that you are able to elicit and name that psychopathology. So I'm going to be going through uh, many, many words to describe psychological phenomena. Uh, before uh, I go into it, I am going to let you know that we have a, a crypt sheet with all the words I'm going to use in this video that's available in, in Blackboard. And um, it doesn't just have a list of which words go under which heading. It also has a glossary that describes it. So, so don't uh, spend your time just writing down all that I'm saying. Just try to listen and you can download this um, uh, crypt sheet uh, um, from Blackboard. Using this is almost like uh, painting by numbers, um, but, it, but it's an efficient way to, to do it. So um, uh, the first heading, we judge somebody's mind by uh, observing their appearance. Appearance is something we do mainly through observation. And there are a, a lot of set of um, uh, words that we're expected to use to describe somebody's appearance. At the minimum, you should use one word to describe each of the headings I'm going to propose. So it's important to describe the ethnicity. So is this a Caucasian person? Is this a black person? Is this an Asian person? Because that is, it's quite important in getting the impression of who it is that you're describing. Also, uh, whether they're overweight or whether they're not. Um, and, and the style of their hair, whether it's long, short, whether it's, um, 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 whether it's dirty, um, and uh, a particular feature. So is this person extremely tall or, 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 or very small? Um, uh, how well they're groomed? Are they 
um, uh, clean do they smell and and how are they dressed and finally what posture you know are they slumped are, are they straight are they rigid the idea of describing appearance um, is that uh, you are creating in the mind of the person who you're going to present the mental state a picture of what this person looks like which is quite important and um, uh, when I was taught to do this um, uh, I was told you've done a good description of appearance if the person you've presented the, the patient to goes into the waiting area and is able to pinpoint who you've interviewed just by looking at them. So that's the first shelf, the uh, describing appearance. The next one is uh, uh, eliciting behavior or observing behavior. And that, again, is something you mainly observe. And, um, and that includes things like the way they walk. And there are specific ways of describing uh, 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 walk. So uh, are they limp? Are they gay? Do they shuffle? Um, do they need assistance in walking? And then there is some specific jargon and like a, a taxi, which is how drunk people uh, walk, which are kind of specific psychopathology uh, terms. Then you can also um, describe somebody's attitude. And there are many words to describe attitude. I won't go through them all. But uh, you can say whether somebody was being seductive or playful or was trying to ingratiate with themselves with you. They were friendly. They were cooperative. They were interested. They were attentive. They were indifferent, evasive, defensive, hostile. Uh, uh, you should use three or four words to describe the attitude of the patient uh, during the mental state. Uh, then you uh, focus more on how they move and w what kind of movement they do. And that's also quite uh, complicated. So whether they're agitated or whether they're very hyperactive or whether they're fidgety, whether they have tics, whether um, uh, they have other kind of neurological movement disorders. And, th and of course, that includes repetition, some gestures that keep being repeated twitches um, uh, and stereotypes, which are kind of complicated movements that don't have a purpose but keep being repeated or automatisms um, and uh, echopraxia, which is when they imitate somebody else's movement and then chorea and all the neurological uh, terms to describe movements, which I'm not going to go in detail, but those should be described at this stage. Um, lastly, there are specific movements linked to schizophrenia, uh, um, and one of them is catatonia, which is when they move very little, cataplectic, which is, you know, sudden uh, loss of tone and stupor when they're uh, unable to respond to any stimulus at all, or whether they appear rigid and uh, whether they're posturing, whether they have abnormal postures that they hold against uh, against any kind of pressure or negativism when they do the opposite. These are specific words to describe uh, movements linked to schizophrenia, which you uh, probably don't need to know. Um, so let, let's move to language. So language is something we, we elicit by listening and also by uh, getting to talk to people. And there's a few words we should use to describe somebody's language because that gives us a good indication of their mental state. So rate, you know, so how, how fluid is it? Uh, are they talking fast or slow? Uh, can you understand what they're saying? Uh, how about their volume? Are they speaking loud or low? You know, and how about the quality? Um, how about how much speech they do? Uh, so in terms of intelligibility, there are a few uh, ways to describe like the slurred speech or mumbled speech or stuttering or stammering or having a strong accent. And uh, in terms of quality, there are also quite a few words to describe. So are they hesitant when they talk? Uh, are they emotional? Uh, is their is there speech uh, monotonous? Uh, and then do they use stereotypical words or sentences? Uh, echolalia is when they repeat things uh, over and over. Um, uh, I won't go through all the little details of, of the different um, uh, qualities of speech, but uh, uh, it's also important to make a comment as to how much they speak. Uh, so are they very talkative? Are they mute? Are they monosyllabic?
Yes. And then we move on to mood, which is one of the uh, big areas of the mental state. And uh, when we talk to mood, we use a, a, a very common metaphor, which is being low is being sad and being high is being uh, happy. And uh, the minimum we should say about somebody's mood is whether is uh, low or high. And we need to describe that from our point of view. This is what I feel their, their, their mood is. And this is what they tell me their mood is. That's called the subjective mood and the objective. Objective is what I think they feel and um, subjective is what they tell me they feel. We, uh, in order to elicit uh, uh, mood and be a bit more nuanced, it is very useful to use a scale or zero to ten and to say, so you, how would you rate your mood, zero being the lowest you've ever been and ten the highest you've ever been? Uh, how would you rate your mood now? Uh, and they would tell you and then they would say, where has it been in the last 10 days or where was this morning? And you can make judgments as to fluctuations in mood and you can use that same um, uh, scale to judge other uh, things related to mood. So, for instance, if you're uh, exploring suicide ideation, you can say, so so you, how suicidal you feel now compared to this morning? So what was this morning? A two. Well, how about now? Now a seven. Um, you know, so it's it's easy to talk about uh, emotions emotions using a scale is a, a, a way of eliciting it. Uh, whether you elicit it using scales or not, there are certain words you need to be familiar with when describing the phenomena associated with mood. So uh, some of them describe high mood, like static or euphoric or expansive mood or elevated mood. Uh, and then there is some of them which are more technical and you should know. So euthymic means um, uh, level mood. Uh, and dysphoric means uh, feeling unhappy and uneasy in your skin. Um, anhedonia means uh, no pleasure and hedo hedonia is pleasure, so no pleasure. So unable to experience any kind of um, um, a pleasure or satisfaction. Uh, and that is important to know because that's one of the symptoms of depression, as I will tell you in the next video. Another one to know is alexithymia, which means no words for mood. That means people who are unable to tell you how they feel. So that's the describing the mood. When describing mood, there is uh, in the mental state, one of the tricky parts of the mental state is differentiating mood from affect. So affect is how responsive the mood is. Affect is to do which how good are they are communicating uh, through body language or, or speech how their mood is. Yes. So um, so the affect can be normal. So they're normally responsive or restricted. So their mood might be high or low, but you are it's hard to tell just by looking at how they come across. Or it can be blunted, which is that there is a very blunted affect, means that no matter what they're telling you, their mood is always uh, neutral and they don't express anything. Or it could be incongruent, uh, that is that uh, their emotional responsiveness is the opposite of the mood they're describing. So somebody could say to you, ha, ha, I feel really suicidal today. So that's somebody who's telling you something terrible in a in a very happy way. That that would mean that their affect is incongruent. This is important because this is linked to psychosis and, and depression. You could also describe affect as flat or, or responsive if, if it changes through the interview according to what they're talking about. That's an important bit, the differentiation between mood and affect. But you describe affect under the heading of mood. More words you can use to describe mood because this is not just about high or low mood. Under mood, you describe fears, anxieties, feeling tense, feeling agi agitated, feeling irritable and angry. All those feelings come under mood and you should elicit those and describe them in this heading. And that moves to the other big heading, which is the examination of thought. Yes, uh, Thought is another big part of the mental state. And thought we divide into two categories. We look at the content of thought. What, what is in the thought? What are they thinking about? And we should describe what they're thinking about. So that they're preoccupied with their neighbors or they are uh, thinking about it, whatever the content is. But the big, the big 
um, uh, issue when describing somebody's thought is whether they are experiencing delusions. This is a phenomenon that is very important that you understand. And uh, a delusion is a belief which is usually false, but doesn't need to be. But uh, it, it is fixed. There's no way you can argue uh, with them and convince them anyway that that's not the way they believe it is. And it is rational. They have no evidence to believe that. Yes, uh, and it's against the cultural uh, norms. Yes, so uh, those are the four conditions for a belief to be a delusion. Yes, um, so it's not so much that is false; is that is fixed and irrational and is not uh, in in keeping with your culture. Yes, so so that's the definition of a delusion. This is something you need to know from the word go. Yes, so. The content of thoughts can also be described in terms of how much they're thinking or how little they're thinking. So sometimes we would describe poverty of thoughts or overvalued ideas when there are ideas that they're thinking a lot, but they're not quite delusions. Yes, And we would include here as well obsessions, which I will describe when we do uh, pathology of OCD. And uh, thought uh, delusions are usually linked to psychosis. So delusions can be mood congruent. So you believe something that is in keeping with your mood. So for instance, if you are really happy, you're manic, really expansive, and you think you can fly, you know, that is a belief that is linked to your mood. So that would be mood congruent. Paranoid is another adjective for delusions, which is uh, what it means is uh, that it refers to you. So a delusion, a, a paranoid delusion is not the same thing as a persecutory delusion. Uh, a paranoid delusion is a delusion that affects to you personally. Yes. And then there are uh, a particular set of uh, delusions linked to schizophrenia, which is um, the delusion of thought insertion, when they, people feel or believe that there are thoughts inserted into their heads, or thought withdrawal, when they believe that other people can take thoughts away from their heads, or thought broadcasting, which is when people believe that anybody can hear their thoughts aloud because their thoughts are being um, referred to the world. These are particular experiences around delusions um, uh, that are linked to schizophrenia. Thought form. So apart from what you think, what's important is to understand how you think. And that's to do with the connections between thoughts. And uh, when the connections between thoughts are not uh, um, something that you can follow, so somebody moves from one subject to the other and, and linking one idea to the other uh, in a way that is, it doesn't make any sense, we call that thought disorder. And there are particular words to describe thought disorder. So if it's, uh, the associations are there but very loose, we call that um, a loose association. Uh, if the ideas are linked to each other uh, kind of sideways, you know, in a way that's not obvious at all, we call that tangentiality. So they talk around the subject. Flight of ideas is when uh, the ideas just keep coming and they have no link to each other at, at all. And word salad is when the flight of ideas is is so dramatic that there is no connection between one word and the next. And that's a, a very interesting experience when you see somebody psychotic enough for a mental state examination. And uh, uh, the other bit about form is when they overvalued ideas, which is something that forms in between form and um, content of thoughts. The important thing to remember is uh, thought disorder very often is linked to psychosis, schizophrenia and mania, the psychosis. So we move now to perception. Um, and of course, the most important thing in perceptions are abnormal perceptions and the star of abnormal perceptions is a hallucination. So a hallucination is the sense of a perception that has no object. So, so there is nothing there, but you uh, see it or hear it or touch it. So there are five categories of hallucinations. So auditory, visual, tactile, olfactory and somatic. That is when you feel that somebody is touching you. Um, and uh, auditory hallucinations, which are by far the most common, uh, are divided into second person hallucination. That is when somebody is talking to you and third person hallucination, which is when somebody is talking about you. Uh, there are also command hallucinations, which is when a voice is telling you to do things and you feel you have to do it. And then there are hypo 
gogic and hypnagogic hallucinations, which are the kind of hallucinations which are usually visual, that happens at the beginning and at the end of sleep. Um, the, the, these are not linked to schizophrenia, uh, but they are kind of wor ways of qualifying hallucinations. What you do need to know is the difference between hallucinations, pseudo-hallucinations, and illusions. So hallucination is when you hear something that is not there at all. And pseudo-hallucination is when you hear something, but you hear it inside your head. So you know that it's not just like a, an experience that you hear through your ears. You hear it inside your head. And that's called a pseudo-hallucination. And illusions are misperceptions when you uh, there is something there and you misperceive it. So, so you think you hear somebody talking to you, but it's actually the tree. And, uh, uh, and, and it feels like somebody's talking to you, but then you realize it's the tree. So it's not that you have hallucinated because you, what you've done is you've had an illusion. Yes? So those three things are very important things to know when you talk about perception. We're moving on to cognition. So cognition is also a very important thing to explore, um, particularly in old age, in dementia, when you, it's very important that you understand uh, whether people understand, are oriented, and their memories are right. And what you are looking at is consciousness, how, how conscious people are, whether they're oriented, and how their memory is. And there is a lot of uh, uh, um, techniques to examine memory, but I won't go here in detail because this is not going to be very long. But there are many words you can use to describe different types of memory uh, problem. The two that it's important to know is the idea of confabulation, which is when somebody doesn't remember something and doesn't realize that they don't remember and they make it up. But they, they make it up to themselves, uh, uh, not necessarily because they want to lie to you, but it's their way of making sense of things that they don't remember. And the second one is the idea of retrograde amnesia, which is amnesia uh, that affects the things that uh, uh, happened uh, uh, recently more than the things that happen later on. And that's a whole uh, hallmark of dementia. So retrograde and amnesia and confabulation are things that are very important to pick up in a mental state when you examine cognition. And that leaves insight, which is uh, the understanding people have of um, of uh, what's going on with their minds. Yeah, so somebody will complain and tell you that they're worried and things because things are not right. And uh, uh, But a lot of people will present with uh, uh, significant findings in their mental state and they will not uh, tell you about them because it's not a complaint. It's something you need to elicit by talking and, and hearing. And uh, there are different grades of insight from impair, denial, um, or uh, uh, intellectual insight when the people know what it is, but they actually behave as if they didn't. And then there's true insight when people uh, really understand things. So these are the main words that uh, um, we, we've gone through. So we've talked about the functions of the mind and we've talked about how to elicit them. And I've talk you very quickly through a lot of uh, psychopathology on how you name things and what those words mean. I'm going to tell a little bit about what you present and what you don't present. So the principles are the same as a psychiatry history. You are supposed to put everything in the right shelf. But um, the important thing in presenting a mental state is which bits you present and which bits you, you omit. You know, So do you say uh, everything that they don't have or do you just say the things that they do have and if they do have do you say everything do you describe everything in detail the important thing to remember is first if anything that they present has a name if there is psychopathology you need to name it yes and the rest uh, the the way i find more useful to present a mental state is to keep track of the pathologies that you are going to to describe afterwards. Uh, so if somebody is might be depressed or psychotic or bipolar, it's important when you present the mental state that you present all the bits of psychopathology and symptoms, even if they're negative, that will help you in the differential diagnosis. And that gives you an indication of what things to include and what things not to include. OK, so I'm going to go quickly through everything I've said. Uh, mental state is the examination of the mind. Uh, we need to be able to elicit uh, uh, phenomena in the mind. We need to be able to name it and we need to be able to present it. The phenomena can be described or better still can be named 
through no understanding psychopathology and we need to keep track that uh, the psychopathology comes from pathology, although the purpose of the mental state is not to describe pathology. The last bit is a mental state comes in a set of functions or a set of um, uh, shelves and you're expected to go through those both when you elicit and when you present. And that's the end of the video on mental state. So as I told you, this is the third video in a series. Um, you should have uh, watched the introduction on how to take a history and afterwards you can see the video on the most common psychiatric con conditions. And that's all. Thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video.